there is nothing more beautiful than uh, being a mother. And uh, when you are a mother, I mean, if you are working for GM and invent something, you know, piece of equipment that may be great, but then it will become outdated at some point, right? And somebody else will invent something else. But if you have a child, so you participate with God, you collaborate with God in the project that will last eternity because you are making human beings that will uh, last forever, eternal souls, right? So this is super important. This is God's design. That is why uh, mothers should be blessed, prayed about, encouraged, celebrated, especially in today's day, days, today's days, you know, in today's culture. That should be encouraged. And also those who cannot have babies for some reason, but they adopt children, this is one of the most noble things to do. And we see in the scriptures, uh, it's always praised and God is pleased when we do that, when we adopt kids and when we raise them, right? So um, may the Lord bless all the mothers. Um, may he provide for all of them. May his will be done in your lives. Amen. Now, uh, is, is it back? To, okay. A couple of announcements. Uh, Bible study, book of Proverbs. We have very good conversations. Uh, I like it. Uh, Everybody is welcome to join Wednesday, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Originally, we wanted to have men's group, women's group. Uh, but because we have fewer people attending, so we have mixed group, but it works out really well. So if you want to learn more about God's wisdom and uh, how to be protected, how to be led by God, so come and learn from the scripture. So it's very, very good Bible study. Today's scripture reading is all of Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 31. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Anna's the high priest and Caiaphas, and John and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men which by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in, in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, 
they let them go, finding no way to punish them. Because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man of whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. When they, release, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported that what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were filled, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power... 31. Oh, I'm sorry. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, then. Th- this is, you cannot, yeah, interesting book, cannot stop reading. That's okay. My I pa- understand. My paper goes to 37, so I was reading. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jared. Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we know that people need God, and when we say people need God, very often we think about personal relationship with God. Well, you need God because you need healing, you need comfort, you need to find peace. Uh, What can I get from God, all the good stuff? But you see that God, in his wisdom, he also has uh, a bigger plan for us. It's not just about us and our our private lives. It's also about his plan, what he's going to do, and sp- namely something that we call church. We say church, which in the Greek wor- uh, in Greek uh, language is ecclesia. It's never about it's never about building. It's never about organization. It's about people. Somehow, God not only wants to have personal relationship with us, but he also wants to build this invisible structure that is called body of Christ or his church. When we say church, we think about St. John Church or Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod or Roman Catholic Church or Baptist Church. We think about specific local churches, maybe buildings, maybe our feelings associated with those buildings, maybe synods or denominations. But those things do not exist for God. For God, either you are a child of God or not. He doesn't play our games with denominations and, you know, all the divisions. If you have faith in Christ Jesus, if you believe in him, you are his child. If you obey him, you are his disciple. If you intentionally focus on learning about him and getting to know him, you are his follower. You are a part of his household. So if we are called together to do something, what is that? What is his plan? Because we've seen people doing church in many different ways, and they have their own ideas about church, and uh, that's all good. But the problem is that very often our ideas do not coincide with God's idea and God's plans. That's a huge problem. We take for granted that we have churches in this country on every corner. 
but it's no longer the situation. So many churches close their doors. So many churches are shrinking, right? So many churches are willing to compromise the truth of God with today's culture. They try, they are willing to compromise to get more people in the pews and kind of like have enough people and have budget and so on and so forth. But this is all not God's plan because where God is working, churches are growing naturally and they're just growing and growing right how can we become part of his plan so that we can also experience the work of the holy spirit and be part of god's plan and god's mission not to be part of uncle joe's or you know anti you know mary's plan and ideas about church but Christ Jesus' idea about church and his plan, not St. John's Council or, you know, Allendale Baptist Church Council. It's not about people's plans and people's ideas. It's about God's plan and God's idea. And to understand that, because that will change our our fellowship in the church radically and what we do in church radically, if we go back to the scriptures and would say, Lord, I don't want to be part of any do-it-yourself project. doesn't matter who comes up with that project. I want to be part of your plan, of your project. I want to be part of your church. I want to be led and moved by your Holy Spirit. I want to do your will. I want to experience you in my life. I want to experience the fruit of the Spirit in my life. I want to be used by you to bring peace, joy, love into the lives of others. How can I do that? And you know what? I've seen many Christians in many different countries in Europe and now in the United States, and there are true children of God, but many of us, we are confused by the way church was done. You know, 50 years ago, we think, okay, so churches, you know, this thing on Sunday, we go and listen and pray and sing. Uh, but church is much more because church is not St. John and St. John's leadership. Church is the Holy Spirit, the designer and the architect of the church, working in real lifetime in our lives and using us for his purposes and goals. So our sermon series topic is the mission of God, the church in the Acts of the Apostles and today. Why we're looking at the book of Acts? Because this is where it all started. And we want to see what actually God was doing, how he was working in his church. And we would be comparing ourselves against that blueprint, the original plan. And then we would be able to see that we are lacking here, or we are not doing this, or we are doing something that is not supposed to be done. And as we align ourselves with the will of God, with his original plan, we will experience the work and manifestation of His Spirit, and we will experience unique, authentic fellowships and prayers and growth and impact. That is something that is available for us today. This is what I, in particular, desire. And today for St. John's, that is in transition, period. This is of utmost importance as well. So, mission of God, it's connected to missio, Latin word missio, which is connected to the word send, sending. We see that our God is a sending God. God the Father sends Jesus, God the Son. God the Son, Jesus, sends his Holy Spirit into the world and sends his disciples us into the world to make disciples to build his kingdom in john 17 verse 18 he is praying about us jesus is praying about his church as you sent me into the world i also have sent them into the world 
But this is a huge assignment. How can we do that? Maybe we need a lot of money. Maybe we need a lot of support from the government. Maybe we need, I don't know, nice buildings, nice parking lots. What do we need? And Jesus says to the disciples and to the church, the Holy Spirit, this is what you need. And in Acts 1.8, he says, but you, he's talking to the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, uh, which is where Jesus was crucified, uh, was uh, died and was raised. And then he says in Judea, and Judea it's neighboring area. And then he says Samaria, which is a little bit farther away. And then he says, even to the remotest parts of the earth. And we know that the message came even to the remotest parts of the earth, say the United States, right? It is the remotest part of the earth for them. They couldn't even imagine that back then. Now, again, he's talking to 12 disciples, the core, and then there is another group, 120. They are not powerful. They don't have money. They don't have connections. They're not in position of power. And then he basically says, go and conquer the world for me. And then they would think, okay, so what kind of resources we have? It's like us today, right? We're looking at the resources we have. And then he says, this Holy Spirit is your resource. And then the day of Pentecost happens, and the Holy Spirit descends, and he manifests himself mightily among the disciples. And then we see something strange is happening. Without social media, without television, without uh, radio, without all the stuff, People hear the word of God, the message, and they accept this message. And when you look closely at what is happening, you would see that very weak people with very little resources are being used by the Almighty God in such a way that his church starts growing like crazy. 3,000 people join the church that day. And then many more will join. Many more will join when we are looking back at the first centuries of the Christian church. We, the historians, cannot understand what happened, why it spread so wildly. It was like supernatural growth, right? And you think, okay, they are not yet state religion. They don't have the support of the emperor. You know, they will get all that later. And that probably was not good, getting support from the government. That, that was not an advantage to the church, I believe. But somehow these poor people, when, when the authorities in Jerusalem, when John and Peter in our today's text are standing before the authorities in Jerusalem, they're looking at them, and what they say, they say these people are agramatoi in the Greek language, uneducated, and idiotoi, idiots. The ESV translates as ordinary people, right? Means uneducated, simple, right? So we have our idiot from idiotoi, which means private person, ordinary person, not educated person. Very simple. And Still, he's using them. Now I think about us. We are used to think, oh, we need money for this. We need nice parking lot because McDonald's has nice parking lot and building, and this will attract people. We need a program, kids program. Uh, this is what will attract people. Uh, we need certain type of music or worship. This is what, what will attract people. They don't have all that. They don't have anything, actually. And they are attracting people. Why? Because it's the Spirit who attracts people. Now, when you think, okay, we need kids program, and then we will attract people, you will attract people, but without connection to the Spirit, they will leave if something changes. If inconveniences appear, there will be no faithfulness. There will not, 
be no commitment. And this is what happens with big churches. So as long as you provide services to people, you keep them, but because it's not the Holy Spirit who unites them, it's your program that unites them. The moment the program stops existing, people are gone. But if the Holy Spirit connects people, even if there are no programs, even if there are challenges and persecutions, people are connected because it's the Spirit who connected them. So that is big question to ask ourselves. Do I want to be part of something that is man-made and something that will collapse the moment dollars are not there? Or do I want to be part of God's plan that stays, that is viable regardless of the financial, political, you know, and other circumstances? It just exists. This is a big question. And here they have nothing except for the Spirit. And I wasn't able to preach on Acts 3 last time, but I want to highlight several things in that chapter because chapter 3 and 4 are about the same event. So chapter 4 is just continuation of something that is started in Acts 3. And what is, what is in Acts 3? We see that this group of people, the apostles, 120, and now 3,000 new Christians, they are in Jerusalem, they are meeting, you know, dedicated to the teachings of the apostles, they pray for one another, they have fellowship, that all is amazing. And then John and Peter, they are going to the temple to pray. And again, think about this. It's not a regular walk because Jesus was just crucified by these people from the temple. You know, high priest, they killed Jesus, right? So, and they hated Jesus. Yes, Jesus rose from the dead. But walking to the temple, you are basically are walking to the camp of your enemies, very powerful, who just arrested and crucified Jesus. And still, Peter and John, they're going to the temple. And here you can see that you cannot do things like that with your own planning, because what happens next to the temple is like atomic bomb, like nuclear weapon exploding in Jerusalem. The Lord takes John and Peter, and they're walking, minding their own business, to the temple. And you need to know that in those times, they didn't have hospitals. Uh, they didn't have, uh, they didn't have uh, what do you call them, um, um, places where people die peacefully hospices. They didn't have rehab center, centers. They didn't have all that stuff. All these people, like, they were either in the streets because they would ask for, you know, alms, you know, so, or they were at home. But you have a lot of people who are disabled, who are sick in the streets, blind people, and they're asking for help. Now, Peter and John, they're going to the temple to pray at 3 p.m., around 3 p.m., and then next to the beautiful uh, gates, they see this lame uh, person, person who cannot walk, because he was born like this. And I'm sure he was not the only person at the gate, not the only person at the gate. I'm sure there were many people at the gate asking for help. Now, what Peter is doing and John, they are going to the temple, and then, and, you know, in Acts 3, 4, it says, and Peter directed his gaze at him, at this lame person, as did John, and said, look at us. And when I look at this, you know, English words, directed his gaze, and when I read the Greek text, the Greek says, and he was looking intensely. This is what it says. It says, atenizo completely fixed, fixated, staring, because fully occupied to observe with great interest and uh, fast and fixed gaze, to fix one's eyes on some object continually and intensely. This is what Peter does. Do you normally do that when you walk down, uh, you know, uh, a street full of beggars? 
in New York, I don't know, Washington, D.C., Grand Rapids, they're asking for money. People normally look the other way, right? Right? This is what we do. But here, Peter stopped and he was looking at this guy intensely. What is happening there? When I saw that, I was just thinking, okay, what is happening here? Why Peter is looking at him? And you know what? It's, it's very important to learn to understand how God is talking to you, how God is communicating to you. Today in our Bible study, we were talking about eight ways how the Holy Spirit communicates with you. But God was definitely talking to Peter at this moment. The, he was talking to him, and what Peter does next is amazing. Peter has, Peter is doing this. Peter said, to this guy, I have no silver and gold, I have no budget, I have no money, I have nothing, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So it's very interesting. When you think about God's church, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul says that the Holy Spirit gift gives gifts to his people as he pleases for the common good. So imagine the Holy Spirit, the designer and the architect of the church, he is giving to people gifts for the common good, and he is using people to grow the church. This is what is happening, right? So Peter is a very good example of that. The Holy Spirit has already notched him on the day of Pentecost to preach, and 3,000 people joined the church. It's not because Peter was a charismatic preacher. It's because he was obedient and he was proclaiming the truth. He was talking about Jesus, you know, that Jesus rose from the dead, and then quoting some scriptures. But it's the Holy Spirit who was working in the hearts of the listeners. Here we see another episode. We see how God uses Peter to and communicate something to Peter, nudges Peter to pay attention to this particular lame person, person who is not able to walk. We know that the person is healed. We know that the person will be leaping with joy. But also this event corroborates, confirms that the message of the apostles is true. And very soon, because of this event, because he does that next to the beautiful gates, and the high priests are next door, and he is just like exploding the whole Jerusalem with this event. But this sign, this Samion, later when you know high priests are discussing, what do we do with this John and with this Peter? They say, we can't do anything. It just happened. And the scripture says that they were not able to antilogeo. They were not able to say anything against this. Right? So now look at this situation again. The Holy Spirit is using Peter and John, sending them to the temple, and in the midst of the enemies, performs a miracle but how he performs a miracle, he nudges Peter to interact with this beggar, with this lame person. And Peter does that. And Peter, something, something God communicated to him, and Peter says, yes, I'm talking, Lord, I'm talking to this person. And out of this, healing happened, miraculous sign happened. And then as he was preaching, more people joined the church of Christ. And I think, okay, do we have those kind of experiences in our lives? And I can tell you, I gave, uh, you know, in my, during my first sermon, I gave my wife's example when we went to Walmart to buy something, and then she went to the restroom, and there in the restroom, there was a lady who was in pain, and who had a lot of problems, and she needed money, and my wife prayed for her and gave her money and shared the gospel. And do you think out of all the places, 
Walmart restaurant? Yeah. The Lord can lead you there if there is a person who is in need. And God orchestrates the events of your life in such a way that you go to a certain place and he nudges you to do to because you can you can you can resist this and just walk away. Peter could have resisted this. He could have thought, okay, this guy crippled, I don't know. I don't know what are the chances of him being healed. Maybe not. Maybe he needs to go and see the doctor. Who am I, right? But no, he felt this nudging and he responded to that and then miracle happened. And this is exactly what we need today like they needed it back then to let God to build his church, but just be available. Just be available and listen to what he is telling you. And then what happens next, Peter says, everybody is amazed because it's right next to the temple. A lot of people see that. Everybody is amazed. And then Peter says, man of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? It's not us, it's Jesus. Right? You see, God performs these miracles not just to help this lame person, because there are many lame people, I'm sure, and blind, but Peter is not working with everybody, right? So, but God manifests his power through Peter. And it's not Peter. Peter understands that it's not my power. It's not my piety. It's not me. It's God. And I just said the truth, right? I just proclaimed the truth. And Acts 3.17, he keeps talking about Jesus. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. He keeps talking about Jesus and his name. By faith in his name, it's name of Jesus. Do you remember? He says, in the name of Jesus, his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So it's a miracle. And then many people would say, well, miracles don't happen very often. We don't believe in miracles, but this is the exact definition of miracle, something that doesn't have happen often. And if something doesn't happen often, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. We were born just once. We are not being born every week or every five years, right? Each of us were born just once. This event happened just once in history, right? We have just one birthday, right? But it doesn't mean that it didn't happen because it happened once. If something happens once, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. That is the definition of miracle, something that happens in extraordinary situation. So this is what happened. This man became, became uh, well and you know healed completely. And completely, it's the another Greek word, the, which is holoclaria. So the condition of wholeness where all the parts work together for unimpaired health. And this is another huge topic. I don't have time to talk about this. But this is very interesting what salvation and healing and becoming whole means. This huge topic, very interesting, don't have time for that. So Acts 4 is the continuation of this story because God moved John and Peter out of all places, not in a small village, not in Galilee, but next to the temple. And he performs this miracle. God knows what he is doing. And Peter listened to him and wasn't afraid. So they are arrested because of this, right? They are arrested because high priests don't like all this stuff. Now it's headache, you know, for them. They just got rid of Jesus. Now these guys are talking about Jesus again. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. This is what they're doing. And then, you know, they 
try to interrogate, examine Peter and John. They recognize that they were with Jesus. Well, they have this Gal Galilean accent, right? You can recognize. So, but what happens next? You know that Peter renounced Jesus three times, and they generally were afraid of, you know, for their lives. But now we can see how the Holy Spirit makes Peter bold. So, verse 8, then Peter, when he's responding to the authorities, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, and this is another, and you know, I read, whenever I get ready for a sermon, I read it in English, and then I read it in Greek, you know, and Greek kind of shows me, like, accents and things, you know, you know, something that is hidden sometimes in the translation. And I think, okay, filled with the Holy Spirit, I immediately look at the Greek, and it's plato. And plato means filled to the maximum. So it's not just filled a little bit, but it's filled to the maximum, to the limit. And I think, okay, filled, and it's passive, which means it's not Peter who does the filling. So he doesn't fill himself up. It's the Spirit that filled Peter at that moment. And the result of that was that Peter was talking with boldness. And that is very important because the fact how Peter and John spoke and this guy who was healed was brought in, these two things made them silent. They didn't know what to say. They didn't know what to say. But you see the healing of the lame is the work of the Holy Spirit. And the boldness of Peter's proclamation is the work of the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit who is working. And you heard from me that the Holy Spirit is doing the heavy lifting, right? So we just need to be faithful and available. Peter doesn't say anything sophisticated, anything like they think that, that from his speech, they were able to very quickly understand that he is illiterate, which means he didn't go to school, he's just a fisherman, and th that he's an ordinary person or idiot, right? Idiotoi. And they don't know what to say in response. Who did all that? It's the Holy Spirit. Right? So this is how the church is working. Now, I'm thinking, okay, St. John, we have elders, we have council, uh, we think about the future of St. John and transition, you know, what's next? And where is the Holy Spirit in all of that? Is it that we say in the council meeting, just get together, discuss, you know, worship times, or, you know, kind of plan? And is that the work of the Holy Spirit? is that it is going to give life to the church, right? So wh what our focus is on, right? Where we can let the Spirit to actually lead us. Because we can resist, we can quench, and we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We, can, we see that in the Scriptures as well, right? So this is a very good question for us. To be in prayer right now, repentance, prayer, and ask for God's leading. So, what happens next, as I already said, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. They were just silenced. Again, who did this? Clever Peter? Who did that? So it's the Holy Spirit. It's God himself who is orchestrating everything. I pray that we, are, that we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit so that we are sensitive to his nudging and leading, right? Any way he leads, right? So he can talk to us in many different ways. So, and then we... Uh, respond. We respond accordingly. So what happens next? The authorities, they don't know what to do. They say, what shall we do with this man for that notable sign, the healing of this lame person, uh, 
Samion, they say Samion, which is a sign typically miraculous, like in this case, given especially to confirm, corroborate, or authenticate something. For that, a notable sign has been performed through them, is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. And what they start doing, they start threatening Peter and John, and this time they let them go, and of course Peter and John disobey, and then Peter and John are beaten this is not the end of the story. At the end of the story, Peter is killed, right, eventually. And John is exiled to a prison, you know, to an island that served as a prison. So it's the end of their stories. But for the time being, we have this notable sign. And when, when the authorities are trying to threaten them, and this is our situation today, because today being a Christian is dangerous. If you are a Christian and faithful to the scriptures, they can cancel you, they can cancel your YouTube channel, they can cancel your business, they can come after you with discrimination laws that you discriminate, they will shut down your business, they would sue you into poverty, right? It's the very difficult, they, you know, to... To, dangerous to be a Christian, right? So, and this is the question that each Christian has to answer. Shall we obey God or shall we obey what the government or people in power tell us to do? And this is exactly the choice John and Peter were presented back then. And they told them specifically, do not talk about this name and about this Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, uh, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We are faithful to the, we are faithful, we are committed to proclaiming the truth, no matter what. That was their choice. And I hope that can be our choice today as well. Now, the authorities let them go because they are afraid of the people. Because the people are excited. They know the guy who was healed. The authorities are afraid. They let Peter and John go for now. And Peter and John go back to their church and they tell them what happened. And then the church is praying about this whole situation. And please understand this. If today somebody does something bad to this church, you call the police, you can sue them, you will hire a lawyer, you will go to the government for protection. <laughs> Back then, those things were not available to them. Right? They were outlawed. They were outlaws. They were criminals. So, which means whenever they had a problem, they could bring it only before God. Only before God. Unlike us, right? We like human mechanisms. So, and this is what they do. This is what they say to the Lord in prayer. They start praying. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. This is their prayer. Okay? This is what they do. If we could only learn this from them, you would see that the church would be transformed completely. But no, we have our wisdom, and we understand that this is risky, and there are, you know, legal risks, financial risks, and we don't want to assume those risks. We want to be prudent and careful, and because we are afraid of everything, we don't do much, right? We don't do much. But instead, when we have a challenge, we shouldn't stop serving him, but we should bring it to the Lord. We should bring it before the Lord. Lord, we have these risks. Lord, we have these challenges. Okay? And as they were praying, look what happened. And when they had prayed, 
the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Well, this is the purpose of the church, because when you speak the word of God with boldness, uh, the Holy Spirit is working in the hearts of the hearers. And he brings them to repentance. He creates faith in them. And this is how they have genuine faith in Jesus. And this is how they are saved. So this is how his church is growing. Our role is to speak the word. We need boldness. The Holy Spirit will encourage us. All right? So this is our role. Our role is very simple, very small. Speak the truth. Proclaim the word with boldness. And the rest in terms of church growth, conversion, everything, is the work of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, right? And this is how this church, because you would ask this question, today, to launch a church, you would think, well, if I was thinking about St. John, what does St. John need today, you know? And then people can come up with many ideas. Well, we need another, you know, 200 thousand dollars to make this you know parking lot look beautiful and we need another one hundred and fifty thousand to build this and to do that and you know and we need another two hundred thousand dollars to hire um youth director and uh, children's program coordinator right yeah you, know, you see how people would normally think right so but no no these people in the book of acts they don't have any of that they don't have any money, they don't have anything, and things are happening, right? Because the spirit is working and connecting, right? So this is this is this is what we need to learn to do. So I'm just amazed how great our God is. And I understand that 2,000 years, 1,700 more precisely, of Christians in the West being okay and being accepted and being able to build churches and become influence the culture that the culture became Christian, it created is in us this kind of we became uh, we 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 didn't need the Holy Spirit any longer because we can do everything ourselves because we had money, right? We can build a building, we can hire people and they will do things for us. Why do we need Holy Spirit? Why do we need Holy Spirit? We need money. Well, we need people first so that they can give us money, and then we can, with that money, do things around the church, right? We don't need the Holy Spirit. So this is what our kind of culture, Christian culture today, taught us to think and do, whereas people in the book of Acts don't have all that. Their reality is different. They have no money, they have no building, they have no connections. All they have is God, right? But then when they are converted, their commitment is such that they are willing to die for Christ. This is something very important for us to learn from them. I invite you to pray about this together with me. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for your blessings, for your grace, for your love, for your mercy. Jesus, we want to have personal relationship with you. But also we understand that you are calling us to build your church, to make disciples, to proclaim the truth. to have authentic fellowship. We look at the book of Acts. We look at the first church. We see that they didn't have many things we have today. And your spirit manifested powerfully among them. And he worked in amazing ways. And we want the same. We want to experience the same Jesus. Give this land, give this country revival. Give this church revival. Give this area revival so that you may be glorified 
and we may be part of your plan. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.